Okay. Now we're recording. And I'll go here. So we talked about fungi and the life cycle. So we don't really need <clears throat> the general life cycle is uh, spores land on some land on a suitable uh, substrate. They germinate for mycelium. The mycelium are composed of hyphae and then it forms a fruiting body, either sexual or asexual, and creates more spores, and that's the life cycle. That's as deep as we need to go. <clears throat> and then we did pictures of various things. And my favorite of the high feed penetrating the cell wall in blue. Um, and then wood destroying fungi, we went through the main three, brown rot, rot white rot, and soft okay. rot. Right. Professor, we are not able to see the slides. Ah. Oh. Why not? Okay. Sorry, okay. there's a lot more steps in teaching in a pandemic. <laughs> I thought I hit share screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. All right. So and we talked about mold being on the surface and not destroying the wood, but uh, consuming the sugars and resins and things in the, in the resin canals and things like that. Uh, we talked about the different requirements required for uh, fungal growth and how when you exceed those requirements, the fungus will stop growing, but it doesn't really help because um, <clears throat> in the, the fungus will grow just fine in the conditions that humans live in. And we talked a little bit about bacteria and how they don't really do much in terms of reducing uh, properties, uh, but they can reduce the pit, they can consume the pit membrane and make the wood more permeable. Uh, but in general, I haven't seen that done too much. Moved on to wood destroying insects, so termites and ants and bees and wasps and things like that. The different orders. So uh, termites are social, right? And <clears throat> there's three different kinds that we looked at: damp wood, subterranean, dry wood. So the ones, the damp wood are confined to us where it's wet a lot in Florida where it's wet a lot. The subterranean is the most common, has the largest colonies and generally the way you diagnose it is with their tube that they travel through. They live in the soil and they build tubes to travel through for protection and then they take the build the tubes up to the wood substrate and eat that. And they can be very destructive, right? Formosan termites are also very aggressive. They've, ca they've caused a lot of damage in the places where they are uh, found, <clears throat> especially New Orleans, but they are susceptible to the standard wood treatments for termites. So even though they're aggressive in terms of growing fast, you know, expanding the colony fast and, and causing lots of damage, they're not any more difficult to control than other kinds of termites. And dry wood termites, and the carpenter ants, bees, and cyrex wasps. So the carpenter ants, all three of these, um, they don't eat the wood, they just use the wood to live in and so a word to remember is frass, right? The carpenter ants, the way you diagnose them is with frass because you saw them dropping the sawdust out of the wood and 
So that's the way you tell you've got carpenter ants. <clears throat> and carpenter bees drill holes, and you remember they drill a hole and then they lay an egg in the hole, and it, it goes away. It's not just a little bitty hole, it's, it's a tube right a tunnel. They drill tunnels and then uh, deposit eggs in the tunnels. And Cyrus, Cyrex wasp does something similar. Um, so do beetles. So you have different kinds of beetles, but the ones that are destroying the forest, uh, the mountain pine beetle and other similar species, um, they bore holes in the wood, they lay eggs, then the eggs hatch and they carry a, a mold fungus, a blue stain fungus with them. And the, so you're, the, and they can also carry wood decay fungi with them. And so that the, um, <clears throat> the, fun, the fungi will grow and then the eggs will hatch and the, uh, <clears throat> the baby beetles, Will um, will will eat the fungus, and then they will fly away and repeat the cycle. There's all different kinds of beetles, and there's the ambrosia beetle has a distinctive track, and um, there are beetles that will attack wood in a house. We talked about marine borers and the three different kinds, shipworms, folads, and the noria, and the <clears throat> shipworms look like this, and they are the most destructive, and they can really do a job on wood in a marine environment. The folads are more like mollusks, and they uh, damage the wood, but only on the surface. There's just drill into the wood far enough to get to feel like they are protected. And then Noria, same thing. They tunnel into the wood as a place to live, uh, but not so much as food. Shipworms use the wood as food. Okay, and then we briefly went over, there are woodpeckers and bears and <laughs> beavers that can cause wood problems, but not typically in a suburban setting, except maybe woodpeckers. Then we covered natural durability and wood protection. So sapwood and heartwood, the sapwood is more, uh, less durable than the heartwood. And that, <clears throat> and we covered different kinds of uh, designs for houses and what uh, you should look for in terms of designing a house, in terms of reducing moisture intrusion and having um, and preventing wood decay, right? <clears throat> and then we did uh, what's right and what's wrong, a little exercise. So, Again, the whole idea is hopefully common sense. Um, you just want to make sure the wood doesn't get wet because the number one way of preserving wood is not with chemicals. It's keeping the wood below the fiber saturation point. And we looked then at treatments, wood treatment. So there's different kinds of hazard classes here that are listed. Um, and there's some very nice buildings that have lasted a long so this is talking now about wood treatment and there's a bunch of different reasons that we that people will treat wood and here's the list of course the biggest one is to prevent decay and there's short term and long term and ground contact and above ground right so this is what you don't do right and dipping is short term you dip it you don't use pressure treatment for short term. Um, <clears throat> and then there's different ways of treatment. So you can, these different ways of treatment, we discuss those. And the one, 
applying toxins and creating barriers, probably applying toxins is by far the most common type. And uh, the others are kind of niche in the marketplace. So treating cylinder and thermal treatments, right? So thermal treatments are a non-toxic way to provide some uh, prevention of decay of wood. And then there are uh, barrier treatments like paint. So very common, you know, you have a wood house, you paint the house and uh, water repellents also similar, but also plastic coatings and wraps are done, especially on utility poles because of the high liability involved in that application. <clears throat> and wood modification, this uh, fun chemistry stuff and acetylation is the most used treatment and it's what is used on the exterior cladding of new PV. And then wood bulking is with uh, mostly the, these days it's where well, you can also use uh, polyethylene glycol. We discussed that as a wood bulking agent, but you can also use methacrylates. They are used and also phenol formaldehyde and the commercial names there are Impreg and Compreg. Uh, they're used, again, it's a specialty market. It's niche, uh, high cost, but high value. Right. And here's Complete is one brand name. And we discussed lubricity, and especially with creosote and railroad applications where you want some, um, you want to give some resilience to the wood so that you increase its fatigue resistance because as trains go over the cross ties, everything's moving because of the weight of the train. And so then we had preservative requirements that are difficult to meet. And then we went quickly through <clears throat> the various preservatives. You don't need to memorize these, um, except maybe to know that there are oil-borne preservatives and there are water-borne preservatives and there's a number of different preservatives in each case. And then we do have, we went over this effect of ammonia on Douglas fir, trying to treat Douglas fir, the difference between ammonia treatments and not because the ammonia can um, clear, clean up or open the aspirated pits. And incising is one way you saw that in the treatment lab that you know, the staple acted as an incising incision into the wood and improve the treatment. And that's done commercially by putting holes or slots in the wood so that you get some treatment at least as deep as the incision. Okay. Proofing can also be used, but it's used pretty much only used on poles to my knowledge. And this gives you a, a shell treatment. So a shell treatment can be just as effective as a thorough treatment as long as the shell remains intact. And there were lots of environmental issues and we discussed some of these and the, how the industry has cleaned up his act. And today it's pretty much environmentally responsible, but it didn't used to be. And people didn't know any better. So over a hundred years ago when the treating industry got started, people just didn't know any better. So the, now they do <laughs> through painful experience. And then we just went switch to fire and just some interesting facts about fire and um, how fire works and the different phases that wood goes through when it burns, right? Phases or stages. How wood can be preferable to steel and fire depending on the situation. And we briefly talked about fire retardants and how they're usually synergistic combinations of nitrogen, phosphorus, and boron. <clears throat> and there are, um, we talked about chemistry a little bit about how 
it's listed as P2O5, but it's not P2O5. It's, phos it's some phosphorus compound, but you do the chemical uh, equivalent of P2O5. And that was that one. Then we moved on to bioenergy and talked about how energy from the sun is the biggest source of energy. Are you seeing this? Or do you see the bioenergy slides? Yes, Professor. I'm sorry, say it. This, these are like for stains and modes. A steel and stains and modes. I think I have to do this. Okay, so now do you see the the chart with the the sun? You don't see anything yet. You don't see anything. No, no anything. Uh, now. Wow, yes. okay. okay, so we talked about <clears throat> the different types of energy, focusing on bioenergy and how the sun is the biggest source of energy. Measured in some pretty big units. Uh, how solar is increasing and the wood biomass is not increasing all that much. Right. There is a move to renewables and solar is increasing. And we discussed the four different types of bioenergy that we covered here remembering that this isn't everything, but it's the major major ones, and it's the ones we that I want to discuss in class. So direct combustion, and here, there was some confusion about this in, it was either the, within the labs, I think, in some of the lab reports. So um, talking about direct combustion and cogeneration is, a subset of direct combustion. In cogeneration, you're putting, burning wood directly, right? But you're making both steam and electricity. But it is still direct combustion of wood. You're not doing <clears throat> any, you're not doing anything to the wood except burning it, right? So the hopefully that's we can clear that up. And then some, just some general data and example of a cogen plant. Um, comparisons of bioenergy to coal. So, and comparisons of different costs for different energy sources. And you can see that um, <clears throat> coal is the cheapest. But coal has so many other problems, externalities, they call it, that it's really not that cheap. If, it, if coal was paying its way to be as clean as wood, this bar would be a whole lot higher. So, and how there are places, especially in Europe, where wood-fired energy or direct combustion of wood is uh, very well accepted and appreciated. And you can burn other things too. You can burn agricultural wastes. And then we discussed about wood pellets and the wood pellet trade and issues of wood pellets from America going to Europe uh, and how that's caused some trouble here at home. We went on to fermentation. So fermentation is um, taking the wood and reducing it to, well, fermentation of biomass in general 
and uh, using supercritical water to extract the sugar. What you're after in fermentation is sugar. And then the, you use the sugar, ferment the sugar to alcohol. So what you're after in fermentation is alcohol. And corn is the largest source of uh, bioethanol. And it comes from the corn belt and the pollution from the fertilizers run down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico and cause a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, <clears throat> and then biodiesel and ethanol are all have all grown over the years, right? And are still growing a little bit. So and then there's a push to move to cellulosic ethanol, which can be derived from wood or wood waste materials or agricultural waste. And, uh, but the market's driven by the government regulation and this cellulosic ethanol, it can be done, but competing price wise with corn ethanol is difficult. Talked about biodiesel and transesterification. <clears throat> so, and the how you how biodiesel plants work. There's a picture of one. And then we talked about um, biodiesel from algae, and that's how that's um, has a lot of potential, but because of the difficult engineering involved of growing things in water and then processing them to get the oil. Uh, it's having a difficult time competing uh, economically. <clears throat> so then we talked about, well, this is actually um, using a bioreactor to grow the algae is all they're really doing here. And they're still losing money. And then we talked about um, making biodiesel from tall oil and tall oil is a byproduct of a pulp mill. <clears throat> it's from the extractives and things in the wood. So we always say that wood is cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin, but it's actually more than that. There's also, depending on the species, can be quite a bit, a few percent of extractives, right? So those extractives end up as tall oil, and tall means pine in Swedish. <clears throat> so they're using the tall oil to make fuel. But most biodiesel come in this country comes from soy. And we moved on to gasification. So gasification is um, heating wood in the absence of air to a temperature above 700 degrees, and this produces syngas. And then the syngas can be converted through traditional technology, which has been known for many, many decades uh, to make hydrocarbons. And then the hydrocarbons can be used as fuel. And here's an example of the uh, different hydrocarbons and chemical name and a common name. Pyrolysis is <clears throat> similar, except it happens at a lower temperature and you get three products from from pyrolysis instead of syngas. You don't much get much syngas. You get a little bit, but not much. The main product, you get a gas, liquid, and solid, right? And um, so the, uh, in the lab, I ask you to compare it to literature values. The thing of it is, the literature values are all over the place. <laughs> so people, get, depending on how they run their a reactor, they're getting all different kinds of numbers coming out. So comparing it to literature values is like, I don't know, I have to figure out a better question to ask on that lab. There's slow and fast pyrolysis. Fast pyrolysis optimizes uh, production of bio oil. And torrefied wood, and torrefied wood is basically just um, pyrolyzing wood, making char, biochar, and um, it can be used as a drop-in replacement for coal and coal-fired coal power plants. And 
on video that I think you had to watch on your own, if I remember right. And charcoal, of course, been made for many years, uh, made from wood, and it's a biofuel made by pyrolysis. <clears throat> and then there are, there is new technology coming along. Uh, we'll see how things work out, uh, hopefully well. So the concept of biorefinery is the analogy to the refi oil refining, petroleum refinery, and talked about that, and bio-based chemicals. So we covered PLA, which is still the market leader in terms of biopolymers, and but then also tall oil and tall oil so we talked about tall oil being used to make biodiesel, but that actually competes with the existing markets of tall oil being used to make chemicals. So a variety of different chemicals can be made from tall oil. They're generally used in various different resins and, uh, and some other applications. Right? <clears throat> and then just some examples here, because there's, there's many, many products that are Biobase, many, many different bioproducts are available. Uh, tried to give you some for biopolymers, something to refer to in the future if you need it. And then we talked about PLA a little bit and PEF, which I think is still a bit too pricey to, to totally replace PET. I don't think it's taken off the way they hoped, but. Uh, it is a bio-based alternative to PET, which is uh, water bottles. It's number one on the recycling code. I think it's number one. And then the Fraunhofer people have uh, come up with a way to plasticize wood so they can make various things out of pure wood. It's just wood. So, although <clears throat> I'm not impressed with the properties, it's 100% wood. And then carbon fiber from wood is, uh, people have been trying to do it for more than a decade and uh, without a whole lot of success, right? Some success. Um, <clears throat> and then talked about how it is possible to make most of the things that we use in our daily lives from bio-based renewable materials. It's not competitive with petroleum, especially today with the price of petroleum being so low, but it is possible, the technology is there. So the hurdles are political and economic. And then we talked about again, uh, carbon fiber and how carbon fiber is not really competitive with petroleum-based fiber, carbon fiber, um, but research is ongoing and hopefully they'll get there. <clears throat> so just, and then that the USDA does have a label that you'll see on products maybe from time to time. I don't see this very often, but it, it does exist. So uh, they certify a product as being bio-based. And, and this thing about eat less meat. Okay. No, no questions. Is this helpful or not? Is this, um, you want me to keep doing this? I'm finding this? this to be extremely helpful. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, if I'm being honest, the subject chair, it was so new to me compared to the first part of this class that it's really nice getting to see it again. So okay. I, I will be here till the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now we want to go to adhesion and let's go back to the beginning. And some usually, so usually um, when we, when I do this live in the classroom, I do most of the lecture on the board. I write on the board a lot. So this one was kind of awkward for me. 
So we asked these different questions and we attempted to answer them. <clears throat> and we had advantages and disadvantages of adhesives and uh, some definitions here. And that is a molecular force. We have to talk about surfaces, right? And it's resistance to separation is how the real definition of adhesion. Some lingo for adhesives and then the five different mechanisms or theories of adhesion. So one is diffusion. If you remember that, the PVC pipe where you have a solvent and you basically dissolve a little bit of the plastic and it diffuses into the other piece that you're gluing together. So you actually get, if you do it right, you get a solid plastic bond at the end. Electronic theory, which is in disrepute, um, and so we didn't talk about that too much and it has nothing to do with wood adhesion. Mechanical interlocking has a lot to do with wood adhesion. Uh, wood's a porous material and you really need to be able to get some penetration of the adhesive into the wood in order to optimize their um, adhesive bond. But it's not the whole story. <clears throat> Covalent bonding is the fourth theory or mechanism of adhesion. And, but again, we don't really see this playing too large of a role in terms of wood adhesion. But adsorption theory is common to all different types of adhesion. And uh, it relies on van der Waals forces to give us adhesion. <clears throat> and if we don't have this one, if we don't have the van der Waals forces and the secondary bonding, the hydrogen bonding in the case of wood, uh, you just not, are not gonna get a good easy bond. So, and we talked about the different, uh, that one over R to the six is how you define van der Waals forces. So it's a force between atoms and the force has a one over R to the six where R is the distance between the atoms one over R to the sixth dependence. And that's very important. Then you have the Leonard Jones potential energy equation. So here's the van der Waals attraction with R to the sixth and the repulsion with R to the twelfth. So R to the twelfth, yes. Uh, the error is the distance between um, electrons, right? Or or molecular, molecular? It's the distance between the atomic nuclei is how they're doing it. Because you see the R to the 12 starts going up to infinity when your distance is getting small but not zero. So it's not the distance between, the outside of an atom is electron, is the electron field and is fuzzy. It's a wave. So it's not, it's very hard. I mean, the, the, you hit the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where you can't locate the electron in space in any, you know, at, a, at any specific time. So, and generally this is, um, sort of theoretical, right? It's not something that you can, I mean, it works and this is, it's an, the equation is, is valid, uh, but it's not the sort of thing you can just go in the lab and do. There have been a lot of experiments that have been done on this, a lot of things that, um, where they take, <clears throat> they have machines that they can take surfaces and they can move the surfaces very close to each other and measure the force. So it's been done for surfaces, but to atom to atom is kind of tricky to do, right? Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you. Yeah. And then we talked about geckos and how the geckos use van der Waals forces to make their feet sticky. And then the next thing that's important in wood bonding is hydrogen bonding. So we discussed that 
and how electronegativity plays a role in hydrogen bonding and how hydrogen being is so special because it's number one in the periodic table and so it only has one electron. When you move that one electron, you now have a proton. It's the only atom in the uh, periodic table that, where that's the case. So it's much smaller and it moves much faster because of its smaller mass. <clears throat> and that gives it a special properties and it allows for the hydrogen bonding. Right? And hydrogen bonding is not only exists in wood, but DNA, RNA, alcohols. We had some data here that show as these intermolecular forces increase, as you go from nonpolar to polar to hydrogen bonding, you increase the cohesive energy because the boiling point is a measure of the cohesive energy in the material. So <clears throat> as you go um, nonpolar to polar to hydrogen bonding, you get very much increase, you get these huge increases in cohesive energy. Okay. And some data for the bond strengths. And again, I don't require that students memorize equations. You can always go look them up. And I don't really require that you memorize numbers. Okay. But to know that <clears throat> this oxygen, this hydrogen bond, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, is stronger than this hydrogen bond, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen. This one is the one that prevents cellulose from dissolving in water. And it's the one that's most common in wood because there's not any nitrogen, typically in, well, there's not any nitrogen in cellulose or hemicellulose or lignin. But, the, but you do have these oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen bonds and the and this oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen bond is stronger. And that will give rise to some really interesting chemistry and allows for some things to happen that would not otherwise happen. Okay. And then we talked about surface energy and how the forces at the surface are different, right? Then in the bulk, in the bulk, the forces sum to zero, but at the surface, they do not. And this gives rise to surface energy and a force vector that goes straight down into the surface. This will results in a, if you're in outer space, it results in a sphere, right? So it's why, it's why a drop of water will be a sphere. Um, a raindrop because of the wind resistance is more of a teardrop shape, right? So, but <clears throat> surface energy. And we had some videos about that. And we went, we derived Young's equation. And also I used the pad, if you remember, to take a, we had a rectangular solid and we broke it in two and gave the definition of surface energy. <clears throat> and then we derived Young's equation incorrectly, but it gets the right answer. Remember that these are uh, we use vectors here, assuming these were forces, but they're not forces, they're energies. Uh, but it gives you the right answer and it gives you Young's equation. And there's a picture. This is the same Young that did uh, Young's modulus. And he also did some stuff with optics and he also translated Egyptian hieroglyphics. Those were the days, huh? Yeah, who has that much time <laughs> nowadays? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we have Young's equation and it's one way by measuring the contact angle, then it's one way to access the surface energies. Uh, cohesion, adhesion is between two materials. Cohesion is within, right? So then we talked about polymers and how you make polymers and how they well you synthesize them and you have this generalized equation here for a polymer. Uh, common polymers, the recycling codes that you see and more everyday polymers. And I like the term macromolecules for things that don't have a repeat unit like DNA and RNA and enzymes uh, because they're coded, right? They have units, but the units 
they don't repeat, they're coded. Um, and some <clears throat> common polymers. The definition between thermoplastic and thermoset, you should know that. So it's by making crosslinks so that the polymer chains can no longer slide past each other when you increase the temperature. So thermoplastics melt before they burn, thermosets burn before they melt. Crosslinking is not a night and day black and white thing. You have a continuous spectrum from completely thermoplastic to completely crosslink thermoset cannot move at all. Depends on the amount, the degree of crosslinking, right? The number of crosslinks. We talked about mechanical properties. The mechanical properties here of most adhesives are elastic plastic. And <clears throat> but there's a viscous component, right? So these things we call it plastic, some people will call it viscous. And we did the silly putty in the happy ball, sad ball demonstration. Um, and the reason it's important, and viscoelastic too, the reason it's important is it absorbs energy. Because what you want to do when you want to prevent fracture is absorb energy, and I'm sure Dr. Nairn taught you that. <clears throat> so the adhesive can absorb some energy and um, give you better mechanical properties. <clears throat> and we went through the <clears throat> various steps of um, putting wood together. So we had these seven different steps and the difference between um, flow and penetration is just the direction. Flow is horizontal to the wood surface. Penetration is perpendicular. Surface prep is the most important and that then the glue has to transfer from one to the other because generally you only put the glue on one side um, you need wetting, so you need a contact angle as close to zero as possible. And then you have to have some kind of trick or um, <clears throat> gimmick or whatever to turn the adhesive from a liquid to a solid because we want the liquid to get intimate contact and Van der Waals forces and then we want the solid to give us a strong bond. And we Are talked about, that? yes. The penetration is through the lumen of the wood? Yes. Well, and it, through the lumen and through the pits, it's whatever, it'll go wherever it can go, right? And you've got a little, you, well, in a hot press, you've got some heat to re reduce the viscosity. So it's just going to go wherever it can go. But the idea is simply, that's where you get the mechanical interlock is through the penetration, right? So uh, you, you get diminishing returns if you go too deep. So generally people recommend something like three cells deep. That can be a little hard to measure since the lumen in one cell can be more than three times as long as the cross section of three cells depending on the grain orientation but some, a few cells, right? A few cells deep. Okay? Yeah. <clears throat> and we talked about how surface aging can give you problems with adhesive bonding and how the <clears throat> it comes from transesterification trans of the uh, extractives on the surface when they contact light and air. And that if you remove the light in the air, then you remove this problem. It can be a real problem in the mill. Um, and it's a lot of times it's a problem when you overheat the surface. So you run, run in the dryer too hot or too slow. And so the extractives have time to move to the surface and react and become hydrophobic. And so you, now you have a hydrophobic surface and you don't get the flow and penetration that you need uh, to get a good adhesive bond. <clears throat> okay, so then we stepped through the, the big three wood adhesives here, urea from aldehyde and benefits and, and advantages and disadvantages, phenol from aldehyde. And we did the chemistry, but 
as I mentioned uh, during the class, I don't require you to be able to write out chemical formula for or chemical reactions on a quiz, but you do need to remember that you have two steps for both UF and PF. You have methylolation and condensation, right? And for isocyanate-based adhesives, you have um, <clears throat> carbon dioxide generation in step one, and in step two, you also have condensation once again. So you do need to remember that because it's important. You have two steps, right? Uh, step one is generally usually done at the adhesive manufacturing facility. Step two is done in hot press or, well, Step two is completed in the hot press, put it that way. Now I talked about this already <clears throat> and advantages and disadvantages and mention a few other wood preservatives or wood, and I call it wood preservatives. I don't know why I do that. Wood adhesives, I get, when I start talking fast, my brain doesn't quite work. I've said wood preservatives so many times in my career that it just kind of comes out. <laughs> So PRF is used for CLT, and you can also just have resorcinol and formaldehyde. Um, and then white wood glue is polyvinyl acetate. We talked about just a few of the other wood adhesives, just to mention them, um, just so you don't think that the big three are the only ones. There's, there's lots, lots of different things that will glue wood together. And we talked about why resorcinol is can cure at room temperature, whereas phenol cannot, because it has an extra hydroxyl group, so it's doubly activated. <clears throat> and I did, um, actually, I didn't, I remember now that I made another mistake there. So, Terrible aromatic ring. So in resource and all, the hydroxyl groups are meta to each other. Right? And but they activate ortho and para. And in ice when I was talking in the lecture, I said that all of the all the other uh, sites on the aromatic ring are activated, but that's not true. So this one is going to activate ortho and para, and this one is going to activate ortho and para. Right? This site is not going to react. So I, I, I led you down the path of mistakes during the lecture. But you are activating these three, right? So now you have three sites that are activated in these, um, and they're doubly activated, right? So it's very reactive, cures at room temperature. That is that. You're crushing it, Professor. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> In this morning, we did composites. And so composites are, oh, wait, I need to share the screen. Where'd it go? Uh oh.
see it. I'll kill all of you. There we go. <clears throat> so this morning we looked at composites. Everybody see this blue screen, blue PowerPoint yes. slide? Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, well, skip the video. And composites have been around. The important things here are the way composites are manufactured and it's the way you manufacture wood composite is the same way you manufacture any other composite or I should say most other composites. Right? And you have these three steps. So that's industrial engineering and an example there. Different kinds of composites or classifications. Forget about this. I'm going to change this. It's out of date. And uh, <clears throat> And we talked about the different uh, laminate. We talked about lamination, right? Plywood, etc. And the veneer-based panels and the different kinds. We just so that I mean I would I would think maybe people aren't too familiar with overlaid materials and wood non-wood composites like wood plastic composites. But the other kinds, I think glue lamb beams and things like that, I think most people are in uh, LVL, most people are <clears throat> familiar with them. Um, so homogenization is part is critical. It's this composite theory now, right? So the way you make a good composite is to make it uh, uniform, consistent, and predictable. And you do that through this step of taking the wood, which is not uniform, not consistent, and not all that predictable, unless you just want to predict that it's going to be very highly variable, and <clears throat> breaking it down into smaller pieces of some kind, variety of different kinds, dozens of different kinds of wood composites, flakes, fibers, whatever, uh, veneer, and then putting it back together. And if you put it back together in the right way. So we walked through Dr. Mashinsky's illustration of how you do this, right? So you combine the board, but then you break it down, you make smaller pieces, and you make a glue lamb beam, right? And if you look at the glue lamb beam, it's much more consistent, much more uniform. Mm. And it shows up when you plot it in terms of the properties here, right? So most of the properties now in the glue lamb beam are um, concentrated in a smaller area as opposed to the highly variable boards that are used to make the glue lamb beam. So then you plot it this way in terms of cumulative property and the important thing here is that because wood is so highly variable, there's a 5% limit value on the engineering design values for wood. And thus, this is really where the advantage of the composite comes from. Because <clears throat> by making the, the composite more, have, because the composite's more uniform than the wood it's made from, it allows you to get much better properties, right? better performance, and away we go. And we stepped through some different, a few different uh, composites and um, advantages and disadvantages, right? So in OSB, <clears throat> the and how it is also oriented like plywood and compared to plywood, it has advantages. It also has disadvantages. So especially that it can't be treated. And you can go buy treated plywood, but you can't buy treated OSB. And then particle board is interesting because the way you make it, the way you process it can change the properties. So different moisture contents will give you different properties and different Press closure rates will give you different properties. 
And <clears throat> that's because as the, um, the mat doesn't have, when the mat closes slowly, the particles have time to rearrange themselves. But when you close it quickly, they don't have that much time. And so you mainly by getting, you mainly get consolidation or higher density on the surfaces as opposed to the core. And uh, since most particle board is used in flexure, then this can give you a significant increase in your performance and your properties. Advantages and disadvantages. And then engineered lumber, blue land beams, uh, LVL, PSL, there's, there's a whole stable full of <laughs> different LSL, there's all kinds of different things and more coming. I think there's more coming all, all of, you know, every, every once in a while, you know, something new pops up because somebody finds a new way to make a wood composite that's better for some application or a particular set of applications and they get a business and they get rich and sell it to a warehouser and retire. <laughs> and then I-beams, good example of a wood composite and uh, how useful it can be and how uh, strong and stiff it can be. Right? And terminology, the flange and the web, you should know the difference between those. So uh, reinforcement of blue lamb with Kevlar or carbon at the first uh, joint between the outside uh, board or lamb and the next one. So, <clears throat> and then uh, like CLT, you have issues with um, trying to get the glue to cure, trying to get cheap glues to cure. So you have to use a more expensive glue. It's not a problem then. Different fiber boards and the advantage here and disadvantages. Um, we didn't have time to talk about CLT, so I don't need to cover that. But I think you all, most of you, are doing your research on CLT. You probably know more about it than I do. I hope so. <clears throat> And I think that's everything we covered in class. Are there any questions now? Um, no preliminary questions now, but I might have some as I work through the practice, practice problems. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Anybody else? So, so I just wanted to ask, sir. Um, do we like have like a practice canvas exam? There should be already, if there's not a problem, I'll, I'll double check. There should be a practice exam already on uh, canvas. If there isn't, I'll, I'll put it there. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, for any clarification, text? our homework and lab are due Monday, just confirming. Yes. Okay. And if you need more time, just let me know. But it would be better for you to get it done before you take the exam. But, yeah, no, of course, of course. I'm, I'm planning on having it done. I just wanted to confirm due date. This week has been hectic. Well, given, given the corona situation we're in, I'm pretty easy about letting people have the time that they need to get things done because we're in really weird times. Um, it's greatly we'll, appreciated, Professor. We'll do that on a case-by-case -case basis. The, okay, anything else? Well, let me know. I will, I'll get your um, papers back to you later today or tomorrow. And uh, I've got, I just remembered I've got some stuff I have to do so, uh, but tomorrow for sure. And ho hopefully I'll get the, uh, I think I should be able to at least get your homework two back to you uh, this afternoon. So, and I'll make sure that you have a practice quiz on Canvas. 
So the final will be, or the exam, it's not a final, the exam will be Wednesday at noon. I'll unlock it, it'll be on Canvas. And I think I set it for, I don't know, three or four hours or something. So I'm not sure how that's gonna work. I've never done it before. So I'll get some help and do it the right way, hopefully. Anything else? Well, if things come up, let me know. I'll be around and I check email often. It's my preferred uh, method of communication. So let me know. And that will do it for today. And thank you very much. It was actually, um, I can't really say I enjoyed <clears throat> zooming the class but i enjoyed you students you really you're good students and i'm um, it's a pleasure to work with you so um thank you I'll professor yeah, yeah professor thank you for a really nice quarter i can imagine the technical technological difficulties so thank you for like providing slides and things like that before lectures yeah yeah sure okay so um i'll see you later have a good day. Thank you, sir. See you. Bye-bye.